Welcome to Dig Deep, the mining podcast. Hi, mining community. Welcome back to another episode of the Dig Deep, the mining podcast. And today's guest is Jimmy Brock, who's the president and chief executive of Console Energy, who are one of the leading energy companies in the US who produce export of high uh, bitumous thermal coal. Um, it also owns and operates some of the most uh, productive long wall mining operations in Pennsylvania. Uh, with a career uh, coal spanning five decades, Jimmy has started from the bottom up as a former and working his way up to his current position of CEO. Um, and he obviously can give us more uh, detail around that. Um, and he's going to give us uh, an overview of Console Energy um, and discuss more about their not so fast campaign um, and their th- and what's happening in the thermal coal environment in general. So that's welcome, Jimmy, to the podcast. How are you doing, Jimmy? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, appreciate your time also. Um, so yeah, how we always start these podcasts off. I wonder if you can just give us a, uh, um, to tell the audience a little bit about yourself and a little bit about your career. Um, as I mentioned, you've been in the coal industry for, for obviously many decades now. So just wondering if you can just walk us through um, how your career has developed to what it is today. Sure. Uh, I consider myself to be very fortunate to be in this position. As uh, you know, I started my career very early, you know, close to home on a, uh, a place called Matthews Mine. And I think it was 1977. I started as a summer student and kind of worked my way through there. And, you know, I worked as an hourly employee, which was tremendously valuable to me because it taught me, you know, how to run the equipment, how, the, how those things operate. And it even provides me with a great, uh, great deal of, I would say confidence today because when I'm talking to one of our superintendents or a VP or something, you know, I really do know what they're talking about when they explain something back. So wouldn't trade that experience for the world. I've met some of the greatest people you could ever meet in the coal industry. They're all just fantastic, great people. So I feel very fortunate to be there. And, you know, I started out as a early employee, you know, learning how to run the equipment. I advanced through my career all kinds of senior executive management positions, but more importantly were those at the coal mine to whereas I could grow with the people and learn actually what what this equipment does and how hard these people work or what they do. So I was fortunate enough to, you know, move all the way up through the ranks to become today, I'm actually the chairman and chief executive officer of of Consol Energy today. A little bit about Consol Energy, we are the largest mining complex in North America primarily here in southwest Pennsylvania. We have uh, three coal mines, our Harvey mine, which is a single longwall coal mine, and then our Enlow Fort, which is a two longwall coal mine, and our Bailey mine, which is also a two longwall coal mine. So those five longwalls together in the complex, I like to use 26 million tons base for production each year. Obviously, we tell people all the time, we run to the market. So we have the flexibility and optionality to flex up or to flex down, depending upon what the market needs. And as an example of that, we've ran as high as 27.6 million tons in one year, and we've ran as low as, you know, 14 million tons in one year, just depending upon what the market calls for. We have around 2,000 employees. We operate very on a very simple concept. Safety, we have core values with safety, compliance and continuous improvement are the three drivers that drive the company. Every decision we make is based on those three, safety obviously being number one. We're very proud of our safety record. This is the second year in a row where we haven't had any life altering injuries. So no one has to change the way they live because they got hurt at our coal mines, which is critically important to us. Also, we uh, own and operate the Baltimore terminal which takes all of our coal to the export markets. So we rail it from the Pennsylvania mining complex down to Baltimore, load it on the vessels and send it to five different continents. So that's a high level aspect of of what the company does. You know, we're predominantly a thermal coal producer, but we uh, we had a goal last year that said that, uh, you know, we wanna have less than 50% of our revenue coming from coal fire generation domestically, just because here in the US, you know, we're kind of under attack. So when you saw uh, our 2023 year end results, we actually had 27% of our revenue coming from coal fire generation domestically. 
So it was a great, you know, change for us and, and worked well. Uh, that's basically the company on a high level. Uh, be happy to, if you have any specific questions about that, be happy to talk about those as well. Yeah, certainly. I just want to cover your um, uh, career, another question around your career. Um, obviously, you've been in the industry for, for 50 years now, um, and you started obviously on the coal face, um, and now you're the CEO. And this platform, this podcast is an educational podcast. So anyone that's listening that may be, may be an operator um, that has aspirations of being a CEO, um, how was your journey and what sort of challenges did you face to get to where you were today? And, and was it something that you set out to do many, obviously, those, those many years ago? Rob, in all fairness, I think if you would have asked me, you know, 45 years ago when I started, would I be the CEO of Consol Energy? My answer probably would have been no, because, you know, those are very high aspirations and people look at those as, you know, you have to have all of these attributes that you can provide to get to that. And I will tell you that the best way to achieve what I have, I have never once asked for a promotion. They've always been handed to me and I was offered to take those. So I, I would tell you, I think the best way you can get there is trust people, learn to uh, care of what they say and what they need, primarily keep them safe. You know, our job really, is to engineer a safe workplace. It's the employee's job to, to take all the engineering technologies and everything we give them, safety apparel, and put that to use and stand safe. But I would say learn confidence in the people. It never hurts to know as much about what you're doing as anyone else. That's always helpful. And then be true to yourself and be true to the employees. Work hard. Unfortunately, you know, we live in a society today where you know, finance is, is not at high end. People don't really understand the finances as well as they should. Our educational system seems to teach a lot of socialism instead of capitalism. And the days of where you, uh, you know, work hard, be f very proud of what you have and learn to live within your means, balance a the budget. They're kind of out of style today. But I would say the key to getting to where I am today and was for me and will be for many in the future is work hard. Be honest with yourself, be true to those employees around you, and be more of a team player than an individual. You know, success is rarely, if ever, accomplished alone. And I've been fortunate enough to be surrounded by some of the very best people you could ever be surrounded by. Yeah, that's certainly some uh, great advice. Um, I want to dive into the Not So Fast campaign uh, that you guys have implemented. Um, and I wonder if you just could walk us through what sparked this um, this initiative and the main message that you're aiming to share with with everyone. Sure. So we launched the Not So Fast campaign because we keep hearing a lot of myths and myth, misinformation when it comes to the role of coal today and especially tomorrow. You know, social media is speculating that coal will not be around in future years which makes it hard for our industry to recruit talented employees and others to invest in it. So we started thinking about, you know, what can we do? How can we change this narrative that we don't matter anymore? Coal really matters today and will for the, for the foreseeable future. So the Not So Fast campaign, it's an awareness campaign that seeks to inform U.S. policymakers, corporate leaders, and the public about the complexities and risk associated with rapidly trans transitioning from fossil fuels like coal to renewable energy sources such as wind and solar. In the last two decades, and this is something people should really think about, in the last two decades, trillions of dollars of spending and subsidies have not significantly changed the energy landscape. 20 years ago, or two decades, hydrocarbons made up 86% of the energy. And today, civilization still depends on those same hydrocarbons for 84% of energy. So it's a mere 2% improvement, and this all came from Mark Mills of the Manhattan Institute. So it's a mere 2% improvement over 20 years. And I would ask the people the question we all should be asking, at what cost? 
and better yet, probably at what opportunity cost. So there's also a, a moral argument for coal in the world. It currently makes up 35% of energy production worldwide. But we still have about 775 million people without access to basic electricity. As a moral, as more and more people in developing countries have electricity and can climb out of poverty, coal will be an important part of that story. So to realize a sustainable energy future, this company really needs an orderly and realistic transition plan that includes an all the above approach to energy over the next several decades. To this end, not so fast advocates for a more measured, analytical, and moral approach to our nation's energy policies, which is you know, critically important for what we do going forward. We, we need great policies that everybody can have. And we say all of the above, we support renewable, we support natural gas, we support an all of the above approach, but you know, we should take away the subsidies. Everybody should compete on a open free market to whereas one that's not distorted by substances. With the not so fast uh, initiating obviously quite a lot of discussion and debate, um, some might wonder if it's all about obviously giving coal a better image. Um, how would you address those uh, that are obviously skeptical about the motives behind the campaign? Rob, one of the things that we are very, very careful about because we know we're a publicly traded company and particularly me is probably Googling me right now as we speak. So we wanted to make sure that everything we put out there is fact based. And it's, you know, we if you go to our website, the coal hard truth, you'll see all the sources behind some of these facts that we've given you. But what we really wanted to do is we became increasingly concerned about the narrative that renewable energy is the only practical path forward. We believe that we still should be a part of that energy mix as we go forward. And we're trying to educate policymakers, the public, you know, other stakeholders of why coal really matters without really jeopardizing any other fuel source or doing that. So not so fast questions this idea, which often goes unchallenged in today's media and culture. We are certainly hearing from some people online and via social media who are skeptical and aren't happy about our campaign. But the majority understand what's going on and appreciate that we're being fact based with everything that we communicate to. And what we really want to do with that is give others the same opportunity to take these facts. So when someone's questioned them, they can say, uh, not so fast. Here's what really happens. For example, if you go to the campaign's website at the Cohort Truth, we have documented our sources for all the information we provide. And it's really hard to argue with facts when you have them there. So to make our case, it isn't enough to simply deliver a message about the advantage of coal and the benefits of affordable energy. We need to directly confront and correct the myth that fossil fuels are a net negative to our society. According to the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, to achieve a scenario where solar and wind provides the majority of U.S. electricity by 2025 or in 2035, transmission capacity would need to grow by three times what it is today. This would require the installation of between 1,400 and 10,000 miles of high capacity transmission lines starting in year 2026. And as a reference point, in 2022, only 675 miles of high capacity transmission lines were installed in the U.S. And then if you look at January through November in 2023, the number declined to 195 miles. So to hit, to hit these real aggressive goals that the administration is pushing for, a lot of things have to happen that we don't believe is realistic. That's why we want to see an analytical and analysis approach to how our energy is managed going forward during this transition period. You know, the grid is rushing to intermittent renewables and the demand for electricity is headed in the other direction. So for, for the last decade, the demand for energy has been basically flat to maybe up 1% annually. Fast forward that with everything that's projected, like the electric vehicles, the electrification for manufacturers, and a big one is the data centers for AI, all those. 
So many people are projecting that that will increase by three times in the next decade. So to do that, even these data centers, their big question and what we have is we're going to require three times more power than the grid than we're using today. Our question, based on facts, is where is it going to come from? And we don't think it's going to be wind and solar because of the reasons I laid out about transmission lines plus other things that are needed to do that. So we want to have a conversation with people about this and encourage people to provide fact-based opposing views instead of simply ranting that our coal statements aren't true with no, no proof to back it up. Um, obviously, given the end, current energy debate, uh, your campaign does obviously put a spotlight on coal's value. Um, how do you see the push for renewables affecting the bigger picture of energy production and usage within the U.S.? All right. First, wind and solar don't have the capacity to handle our country's energy needs and have a long way to go to get there. Now, they may at some point in time, but today they don't. Also, there are intermittent sources of power. They don't work if it's cloudy or if there's no wind blowing. We saw during the winter storm in 2021 in Texas, where hundreds of people lost their lives, coal was then used to provide the energy need because renewables were not unable to do so. History has provided us with many lessons in the past about why we need to have baseload fuel secured on site that we can use. If you look at the back in 2016 here in the U.S., we had something they labeled polar vortex. It was extremely cold from November to March. But you know what? I call that winter. It's supposed to be cold in the winter time. So I don't think it was an anomaly. I think it was more of a regular winter. And then we've had other lessons. You know, the bomb cyclone was another one. And all of these situations, thank God we had coal fire generation because they provided 50 to 75% of the additional kilowatt hours that were needed to provide basic electricity to people. I don't think most people realize how much infrastructure build out will be required to facilitate this energy transition. Coal is used to make steel, concrete, and other materials that are key components of renewable energy infrastructure. So the world could need more coal as the transition plays out, not less. And did you know that for every one megawatt of power created with onshore wind turbines, more than 100 million, more than 100 metric tons of coal is needed. So outside of power generation, coal provides key ingredients in fertilizer for food we grow and in water filtration to provide us with clean drinking water. Coal is also being used in research and development of high performance materials for aerospace, military, battery storage, building materials, and other high technology applications. It is used in hundreds of products we use every day as average American. An average American uses 3,000 pounds of coal every year without really even thinking about it or really not even knowing what's there. Even as the transition from fossil fuels to renewables take place over the years ahead, the increase in electric vehicles and the push to electrify industrial processes and homes will create even more demand and strain on the current electrical grid. Because renewables are not always available, sources of energy we need at least two times the amount of wind and solar based on the annual average across the United States. So to provide the same amount of power as a fossil fuel power plant, some estimates calculate that renewable power requires at least 10 times more land area than fossil fuels per unit of power produced. Astonishing number to many of us, especially to those whose goal is low impact to no impact to the environment. We're actually achieving the exact opposite of what we claim to be seeking. The campaign also mentions a push from obviously government to achieve a, a net zero emissions between 2025 and 2050. Um, can you share some examples of in, uh, unintended consequences that we might not even be considering? And I think you've obviously mentioned quite a few things already. Sure. As Americans, we've come to enjoy the freedom to make our own decisions on just about everything in life. 
if we want our homes to be warmer in the winter, we just turn the thermostat up. If we want them to be cooler in the summer, we turn the thermostat down. We have that choice today. Achieving net zero emissions by 2050 will require far more than reducing our reliance on fossil fuels. Experts have shown that scenarios modeling this aspirational goal call for alarming changes to our freedoms and lifestyles. We could experience mandated travel restrictions, ride sharing in urban areas, lower speed limits on our highways, and even the regulation of our own thermostats. So people don't really think about that until it happens, but those are some of the consequences that obviously are being talked about today. I think there's many times, whereas I've seen it here in the US, particularly in California, some here in the East Coast, to whereas the independent operating systems have came out and asked to conserve power like during peak hours, say it's uh, five to eight at night. So I think we should expect to see more of those things coming at us as we try to get to that. And achieving net zero emissions by 2050 will require far more than people understand. For an example, massive amounts of critical minerals, you know, rare earth materials, if you, particularly if you go to these battery storage, whereas you will need, you know, a lot of the metals that go into that. Most of those today are mined in China and we're already dependent on those coming over. So it hurts our national security as well. And quite frankly, we don't believe that they have the same environmental standards or humanity needs that we do here in the U.S. So we think we could mine those materials here safer and be more environmentally friendly. And those are some of the trade-offs that we'll do. I would say a lot of these are not necessarily consequences. They're trade-offs that we would have to be willing to do to get to that net zero by 2050. And I think, again, our Not So Fast campaign is saying that realistically, we don't believe we can get there anyway because of the slow pace it'll take. And I'll talk about it a little later, but another big issue of that is permitting. You know, to mine these critical minerals, we know how long it takes to permit something here in the U.S. It's 10 to 12 to 13 years just to get the permit to do these. So to say we can get there by, you know, 2035, 50% reduction, then zero by 2050 is a stretch in our belief. And we think Americans should know that before they're making some of these decisions. Uh, on the topic of uh, energy independence, um, how does Concel Energy view uh, the role of coal in ensuring that America stays energy secure and self-sufficient? If you if you look at coal today, it, you know, far as electricity generation, it is 35% of global energy today, as we said here. So in the U.S., you know, coal has fallen to it, whether it's 20 to 22 percent of the generation here. And there's reasons for that. Obviously, we've lost some market share to natural gas, you know, which today is, you know, below two dollars in MCF, which plays a big effect on that. But when you look at, at what we do here, so we are retiring base load generation faster than we're bringing on replacement generation. And I, for one, believe that before we retire any generation today, we should have a reliable resource 24-7 in place and operating, still in the ground. Not planned to be, but up and running before we retire that generation that is prov uh, providing electricity today. So that's, that's one. Then the other key part about it, just think about what happened in Germany. So Germany, you know, made a decision years ago to go what we'll call green and to do away from coal, period. Not necessarily fossil fuels, but coal because they went to natural gas. And then, you know, the Russia-Ukraine conflict uh, interrupted supply, I will say, so they couldn't get the gas anymore. And they were paying a pretty high premium for natural gas from Russia prior to that as well. So when that happened, what did Germany do? They went back reopen some of their coal-fired plants to meet the basic needs and to save lives in the winter from extreme cold or to be able to cool the homes in the summertime. Here in the U.S., when we retire a coal-fired plant, for whatever reason, we get in a hurry to demolish that plant, take it down to where it's not there. So we don't mothball it. We might for a short period of time, but the quicker we can demolish it and get it out of the way, that's what the environmentalists push for. 
That's what we do here in the U.S. So we would have not have had that option. That's what happened in Texas. You know, that's why we advocate for an all of the above approach. If Texas would have had, you know, Texas had not have had coal, they had a lot of natural gas, but some of those wellheads froze up to where the deliverability of the supply was disrupted. So coal, again, the incremental kilowatts that were needed supplied 50 to 75 percent of those. That's why we advocate for an all of the above approach. Again, we think that that coal can be mined safely. It can be mined environmentally. We've proven that. But again, it needs to be a part of the energy mix. It's a vital part of the energy mix. And those people who say it needs to be left in the ground simply don't know how valuable it is, not only from a generation aspect, but from an everyday use as well. Um, sustainability is a word that everyone uh, thinks about and is thrown around these days. Um, can you just tell us about some of the steps Conso Energy um, are taking to move towards more sustainable coal mining and other practices? Yeah, well, as I said before earlier, you know, we, we operate every single day. We manage and operate by our core values, which is safety, continuous improvement, and compliance. So let's take a look at, you know, at Consol, we take a holistic view at improving the sustainability of our operations. This starts with our core values of compliance and extends to voluntary initiatives to reduce our environmental footprint. For example, with respect to environmental compliance, we measure compliance with our water discharge permits as a key indicator. We are incredibly proud of our near perfect record, which has exceeded 99.9% .9 for 11 consecutive years. In addition, in 2023, our environmental compliance expenditures totaled $69 million. This magnitude of investment reflects our commitment to environmental stewardships. At the same time, our sustainability approach includes voluntary projects. For example, in 2019, we were proud to be the first pure play coal operator to announce greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. We were striving to achieve a 50% reduction in our scope one and scope two emissions by 2026 compared to our 2019 baseline and an aim to achieve net zero emissions by 2040. Our board has approved capital expenditures of approximately 30 million to support our goals. Other voluntary efforts include projects that reduce our water consumption by reusing water in our operations. For an example, in 2023, we recycled a record 794 million gallons of water in our operations. We're also deploying technology that will help us identify opportunities to reduce electricity consumption and make our water treatment facilities more efficient. All of these efforts to make our operations more sustainable, whether for compliance purposes or volunteer in nature, are preparing us for the future. You know, I travel a lot on the road with a lot of investors and as you know, two years back, the big topic you heard about was ESG. And it, it really wasn't so much about the, the S or the G, the social or the governance part, it was really about environmental. So we take that very seriously. We have a, a manager VP that's over our corporate sustainability does a great job with it. And she, we put out a corporate sustain, a sustainability report annually, which lists where our goals and targets are. It's not anything that we're ashamed of. In fact, we're proud of that because again, we believe we can mine coal safely and environmentally friendly as well. Um, I've seen recently the, the launch of console uh, innovations. Um, just wonder if you could just tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, yeah, when it, when it comes to the future of coal, I get very excited about coal's potential for uses beyond electric generation. So for innovation is another key campaign message, and we're developing several ways to diversify coal's potential. We recently launched a Consol Innovation sector of our business that's, you know, standalone. We fund it. We want to take advantage of its unique chemistry for use as feedstock to innovate advanced materials. The R&D efforts here are extremely promising to whereas we're looking at what else can be done with our product, coal, 
in other areas other than coal-fired generation. We see coal becoming a high-performance material in aerospace, military, battery storage, building materials, and other high technology applications that you know we have talked about and we'll talk a little bit more about those but some of the some of the examples i would give you is some of the composite deck boards whereas uh, we take pulverized coal and plastics to you know create this deck board and believe it or not it's actually uh, fire resistant because that was a big question with me when i went to the team you know it's made out of coal how can that be but it's the chemical analysis that we do so that's a promising thing. And then we have other th other uses of the coal, particularly in our uh, high carbon strength materials that we're looking at from coal that can be used in aerospace and are used today, in fact. Um, you're working on something pretty exciting uh, with the Department of Energy, um, the 21st Century Power uh, Plant Project. Um, can you give us a rundown of what the project entails um, and its potential implications for the future of energy? Yeah, this is uh, pretty exciting for us as well. We call it now the 21st Century Power Plant Project, and it aims to design a waste coal and biomass fueled power plant equipped with carbon capture and storage to produce power with a net negative or zero CO2 emissions. The project is currently in its third stage, a front-end engineering and design study, and if successful, could be demonstrated in, say, like the 2030 timeframe. Importantly, through this project, we are advancing the state of knowledge surrounding CO2 storage in the Appalachia Basin. We're also learning about the challenges, cost, and realistic project timeframes associated with deploying these low CO2 and advanced technologies that are critical to achieving global greenhouse gas emission reduction goals. The 21st Century Power Plant is just one example of our innovation initiatives. With support from the DOE and multiple project partners, we are also looking at leveraging the physical characteristics of our high quality coal in a variety of low to no emission applications. For example, Using coal to develop high performance decking boards could require less energy than manufacturing the current commercial alternatives, which translates to lower manufacturing costs and emissions. The U.S. has the most abundant coal reserves of any country in the world. These early stage initiatives have the potential to open new sustainable markets for U.S. coal and to create jobs. These applications align with our overall approach to create net positive for national security, the economy, and the environment. I'm not a climate scientist, but one thing I do know is this greenhouse gas issue is not a state, local, or regional issue. It's a global issue and should be looked through a global lens when you're looking for solutions to solve it. So the big thing that the 21st century power plant will do is you know, our objective here is to actually take the coal waste or tailings, you know, that are produced and then run a percentage, say 10 to 15 percent of biomass. And that will get us to the net negative or net zero emissions. And it would be right today. Our priority fuel, if we were to choose, would be dirty chips left behind from timber. And so it's like a waste wood product that we've used. They're moist chips. And we are very clear that the fuel source needs to be flexible. So we could use wood pellets if we had to, which are already available. We could also use switchgrass. And, and it's even capable to burn our own coal with the same zero emissions, providing we have the biomass. So it's pretty exciting for us. And it could alleviate you know, future uses for slurry ponds or things like that. It's going to be a much smaller, we're thinking about somewhere around a 300 megawatt uh, power plant. And of course, you know, we need a lot of things to happen between now and then to make that go. But it is exciting to have the DOE partner with us as well as others to bring this 21st century power plant to fruition. And lastly, uh, and wrapping up, what is the outlook for console energy over the sort of next six to 12 months? Um, and is there anything else that you want to add? and share with our audience? No, I think the outlook for us over the next, you know, six months to a year is, is positive. And I think it's even longer term for that. 
Consol Energy, we produce a very high BTU product that's seeked worldwide for our marketing campaign. We do have our own Baltimore terminal that will simply, you know, allow us to take this coal into the five different continents without having to have a third party operator to move our coal, such as we're doing today because the, the port is down. So we're having to look for other sources on the East Coast. But I believe that, you know, we are the low cost producer in, in northern Appalachia. And I think we'll continue to be that. And, you know, I always end everything I do with this statement. Never apologize for what we do. We're a vital part of the energy mix. We will be for the foreseeable future. And we will keep using technology and innovations to make us better day by day. So for all those young engineers and people out there who are there telling you, do not go in mining. Coal mining will not be here in future years. I would say it's simply not true. If you look at all the facts that we just gave, I think it indicates that, you know, we are going to be here for a long time. I think decades, not years. I think decades. And obviously at some point in time, we as a country and we as a planet should look for new innovative ways to use this valuable resource, abundant resource that we have, instead of trying to villainize it and choose other fuel sources that are being propped up, quite frankly, by subsidies and tax credits. When those go away, the consumer will pay the additional cost to, to keep those things viable. And then I would say the last thing is I would advise anyone that's listened to the podcast and wants to know more, visit our website, the Coal Hard Truth, C-O-A-L-H-A-R-D, truth.com. All of these facts that I talked about today are in there and many more. And join us with the conversation. Help us let people know that we do matter if you believe it. And if you don't believe it, go back and look at these facts and see if you can get yourself there. Because I do believe we're a vital part of the energy mix. I think we're going to survive for the future. And if we want to have 24-7 reliable electricity, we're going to need to be part of that energy mix. I mean, solar is great if you live where the sun shines. Wind is great if you live where the wind blows. But we need an all-above approach to whereas those people that don't have those can still have electricity 24-7 for basic needs. Jimmy, thank you for your time. Really appreciate you in sharing your story, telling us about console energy, and also educating the audience around a lot of the facts and figures that you've, that you've gave. Um, and I think that needs to be shared, not, with, not just so within our mining industry, but people outside. Um, and I will uh, I'll obviously ask our audience to do that. Um, we'll put the show notes um, and some of your social media links in our show notes so people can uh, access that and have a look at that uh, document that you that you produced and also obviously your website as well. So uh, thank you for coming on um, and give, educating our uh, mining industry um, and obviously really appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks for having us. We, uh, we like to talk about the company and we love our story. Yeah, no, great. Um, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed that episode. As always, appreciate your continued support. Um, I think this episode obviously needs to be shared, not obviously not just with people in our industry, but people outside of mining. A lot of people outside of mining don't have any idea of what mining is about. And this is this demonst this this particular episode does demonstrate um, an issue that a lot of people outside of our mining uh, outside of our mining industry are, are, are unaware of. Um, so I really appreciate if you can share this episode to those that you know, um, or even if they, uh, if you're talking about the, the energy transition, please show them this, uh, this episode um, so they can get more of a balanced view. So until next time, happy mining. Thank you for listening. Remember to reach out to Rob via the show notes and be sure to subscribe and leave a review. Until next time, Happy mining, helping each other to improve the mining industry.